Now there is a kind of unimolecular E1 reaction, in case you were wondering. <laughs> All right, so that's going to be analogous to our SN1 reaction. E1 and SN1 uh, are very similar, and E2 and SN2 are similar in some ways, like even though they're totally different reactions. So far you've learned strong bases react with E2. So whenever I see a strong base, I'm going to get this concerted kind of reaction that leads to Zaitsev-Hoffman. And then over here, um, what if I use a weak base? Is it possible to still get elimination? And the answer is yes, but you're going to have a different pathway. And that pathway is called E1. So let's see what happens here. With weak bases, I think of them as sort of lazy. I know it's not politically correct to <laughs> use that term, but they are. They're pretty stable. They don't need to go out there and do stuff. So these just sort of hang around. Usually it's the solvent. So sometimes these reactions um, are called solvolysis because you're you know, using a solvent. But in any case, base doesn't really have a role to play in the rate determining step. And just like with SN1, we saw that the leaving group can dissociate and create a carbocation first. So that's what's going on here. And this happens better when the carbocation is more stable, like a tertiary or a benzylic or a lilic. Now we have a base hanging around and it's like, oh, whoa, carbocation. Okay, I got to get to that. So... This base is going to react with the carbocation because this is now way more reactive than it used to be. Let's bring in our base. Now, it's really tempting to just grab this water and attack it at this carbon, right? Negatively charged um, or partial negatively charged oxygen, electron rich, nucleophile attacking the electrophile. But that's going to lead us to SN1. That's how SN1 worked, was the bromide comes off and a water goes on. Okay, this is elimination. So what do we make in elimination? We make alkenes. Alkenes, so we need to find beta hydrogens. So let's look for all the possible beta hydrogens. Okay, so here are my beta hydrogens. And I can take any of these, but I'm going to take the one that leads to the more stable product. That tends to happen more in these E1 reactions because even though steric hindrance seems like it could be a factor, um, the more important thing is all electronic factors. It's all about stabilizing this positive charge and we want to make sure we form a transition state that is more stable and so since the Zaitsev product is more stable, its transition state leading to that will be more stable. So how do I, which, which hydrogens should I remove then to make that more stable product? Should it be these? these or these. So I'm going to picture that the double bond needs to be on the inside. That's my Zaitsev product right here. So in order to make the double bond here, I need to take these hydrogens. So I'm going to use my base, grab a hydrogen, and then collapse that bond inward. So this is my Zaitsev product right here. So I'd like you to practice this. This is an E1 reaction. Notice we made a carbocation first, so of course rearrangements are possible. Watch out for that. And we have a weak base, so it doesn't come in at the beginning, it comes in after the intermediate. And we make a Zaitsev product. We usually don't make a Hoffman product unless that's the only alternative. Or you'll see that a Hoffman product is possible as a minor product, and we're talking about major product here. Which of these substrates will not undergo E1 reactions? So let's take a look at E1 mechanism is that it goes through a carbocation intermediate. So see if you know which of these would be likely to go through a carbocation intermediate. All right, so of all of these, um, this is probably the best one is tertiary, but uh, secondary could also occur. Primary, I would cross out, uh, will not undergo E1. Tertiary is okay for E1. And then this last one is tertiary, so it should be okay for E1. But do you see why it won't be? Well, in the first step of E1, OH has to come off, and hydroxide is a very poor leaving group. So unless you're already in basic solution where you have hydroxide floating around anyway, um, this is not going to be super easy to happen. Let's try this one now. Even though a weak base is used, the reaction undergoes a very slow E2. So why would that be? And then once you figure that out, what would the product and the mechanism be? 
So normally looking at this, I would say that I wouldn't expect E2, but they're telling me that it does eliminate and it can't do so by E1. So that's because this is a primary carbocation and those are just too highly energetic to form. So I'm going to instead kick this out by using some of the base strength of this methanol. So I'm going to look at my beta hydrogens, which are right here, and I'm going to grab one of those hydrogens and do this E2 mechanism here. So that means my final product should be something like this. So I want you to practice when you see E2 that you know what that mechanism is. You know to look for those beta hydrogens and that you're making an alkene. Okay, this one is good practice as well. When there's a bad leaving group, it can be converted to a good one. So it's a very important concept. And you're going to do a lab that's based on this, on experiment 25. So OH hydroxyl group, you have H3PO4 or H2SO4 is commonly used. I like to just abbreviate it as H+. And so what's going to happen is first an acid-base reaction where I grab that. And then I'm going to make uh, a protonated alcohol, which is then going to be a good leaving group because this protonated alcohol can leave now is water. Okay, when I take that away, what am I left with? So now I have a carbocation, and from here, I wanna think of all the different E1 products I can get. And how do I know this is E1? Uh, remember, E2 is strong base, E1 is weak base. That's the whole point of this. So E1, um, I can have beta hydrogens. Um, let's draw them all in. Okay, so I've got beta hydrogens here, here, and here. So I can make at least three alkenes. And then you want to also think about rotations. What if the bonds are rotating and then a double bond formed? That means you can have E or Z um, stereoisomers. So at this point, I'd like you to go ahead and draw at least the five possible elimination products then. So five different alkenes and note which ones are E and Z and make sure you catch all of them. All right, so I've got five different alkenes here. I've got my E and Z version from this, these beta hydrogens being removed. This one results in this E and Z and then these result in those. And our minor product would be the Hoffman because it's the least stable uh, product. Um, and our most stable ones would be our Tetra substituted if we have any of those uh, right here, we've got tetra substituted right here. So these would be major and this would be minor. All right, here are a couple more problems. Go ahead and try these together. First, think of what starting alkyl halide you can use and they say use an alkyl bromide. So what molecule would you have to start with if it had a bromine on it as your leaving group in order to treat it with NaOH to get this alkene? So this is a strong base, so is that E1 or E2? This is an E2 reaction, okay? But in any case, you still use the concept that the beta hydrogens are taken off and the leaving group leaves, you make an alkene. So see what two possible structures you could start with to get this, and one of those possibilities is gonna be better than the other. And then for this one, I want you to try to practice your mechanism. So starting with this, show me how this molecule's reaction together will give you this alkene versus this product over here. So show me how this works to give you this, and then show me how that works to give you this. And you do want to practice your mechanisms because I definitely ask about that on the test. Okay guys, let's look at how to approach this going backwards because we haven't done a lot of that. Here's your alkene right here. So you know that the bromine or leaving group has to be on one of these two carbons. So that makes it easy to come up with some stuff there. So if I have a bromine on the methyl group or next to the methyl group, I'm gonna get two different outcomes. First with this one, notice that there's only one beta hydrogen here. So you're gonna have to lose it this way. So you're only gonna get this double bond. So that's the better of the two because you only have one possible product. With uh, this one though, you have multiple beta hydrogens. So you can take the internal ones, and since this is a small base, that one will be your major product. This is your Hoffman, so it'll only be a minor product. So the first, this one is better. As for mechanism practice, we've got a secondary, uh, which means it can be SN1 or E1, or SN2, 
uh, or E2. They're all possible with secondary. And what we have here is a weak base. So we can't, it's not a good nucleophile, so it's not SN2. It's not a strong base, so it's not E2. So what we have is a combination of an e E1 and an SN1. But notice the carbon skeleton. It's got a terp-butyl group, and here it's got isopropyl, right? So something's going on here. Whenever you see a weird arrangement of the carbon skeleton, it's usually carbocation rearrangement. So let's look at what's happening here. First step of SN1 and E1, it's unimolecular, so the base and nucleophile are not involved. The leaving group dissociates first. We make a carbocation, and you always want to look for the possibility of rearrangement. Here it's secondary, but nearby we have methyl groups that can shift over and give us a tertiary carbocation. So one methyl group goes from there to here, and now this is neutral, and this takes on a positive charge. So after this rearrangement, then I can have either elimination or substitution. If I have elimination, I look for my beta hydrogens. E1 favors Zaitsev and the more stable alkene. So I'm going to take the internal hydrogen, not a terminal one. So I'm going to grab that and I'm going to make my alkene. If I instead want to attack the carbocation, I can do that as well. I have methanol act as a nucleophile and it attacks here. Um, then I get the methanol attached and then another methyl alcohol comes in and grabs that H to deprotonate and neutralize it. So that's my SN1. So at this point, you should be able to draw out an SN1 and an SN2 reaction, compare and contrast the two, know the terms concerted is one step, step wise means multiple steps, one step after another, inversion versus racemic mixture as products, unimolecular, bimolecular, carbocation language here, benzylic, allylic, vanillic, all that, all that, all that stuff, aryl, okay? Predict SN1 versus SN2, and now be able to predict E1 versus E2, Zaitsev versus Hoffman, okay? Um, and, um, and then practice your mechanisms. So have an E1 example and an E2 example. So you could even write this as your E1 example, okay? And you can use uh, this as your E2 example, you know? But in your examples, make sure you show the mechanism. How is it happening? By mechanism, I mean show me each of these steps, every intermediate along the way. And that will help build your understanding of what's happening. All right, see you next time.